Chapter 4 <clears throat> Some call Revelation 4 the throne room scene. And in Revelation chapter 4 we see God the Father seated upon the throne. And he has in his hand a book that is sealed with seven seals. And of course chapter 4 leads right into chapter 5. And in verse 1 of chapter 5 it says, I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was worthy to found was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to lo loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld and lo in the midst of the throne of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. In our last presentation we read a, a quotation where Sister White um, it's on page 14 where Sister White I was using it to identify how the truth of God's word is sealed up and under the title of the sealing on, in the middle of page 14 it says when Chi Christ came to this earth the traditions that had been handed down from generation and the human interpretation of scriptures hid from men the truth as it is in Jesus the truth was buried beneath a mass of tradition the spiritual import of the sacred volumes was lost and then you'll notice in the next paragraph it says, but the line of the tribe of Judah, and this is who we're, we're identifying here in chapter 5, and this is Christ. But the line of the tribe of Judah prevailed. He opened the seal that closed the book of divine instruction. The book that the line of the tribe of Judah opens that's sealed with seven seals in chapter 5 is the Bible. And the following narrative after where we read to in chapter 5, of Revelation is describing how Christ opens, removes the seals one at a time from the Bible. Um, I'm looking here now in your notes. I, I don't remember, but I think that I have a, a quote in the back section that if, if I do, just give me a second to look for it from um, James White. And in that passage, he's dealing with the line of the tribe of Judah, Christ removing the seven seals. And he points out correctly, I believe, that the removing of the seven seals one at a time from the Bible that Christ accomplished began, it's a parallel passage to the unsealing of the book of Daniel in 1798. Um, if I don't come across James White's quote almost immediately, I will quit looking for it. Because I may not have put it in these notes. It was in... It okay. The one where he compares... Um, This isn't the one. Uh, that, that's, that's he has a very nice one that I may have left out of here because it was rather long. Anyway, I'll, I'll tell you what he says. I have the quote on my computer. Um, as he compares the work of Christ removing the seals one at a time with the opening of the book of Daniel being unsealed in 1798. The point that I, that I want you to see 
is that, and James White will agree with this, even though I don't have the quote right, right front and center for us here, that in 1798, when the book of Daniel was unsealed, it was Christ that was accomplishing that work. Christ, when Christ is portrayed as the lion of the tribe of Judah, one of the things that it is identifying is that it is the work that Christ is doing to, un, to open the Bible to his people for this generation. So the book of Daniel is sealed up in the book of Daniel. It's unsealed in 1798, but the books of Daniel and Revelation, they're the same book, they possess the same information. So in Revelation, when the Lion of the tribe of Judah is illustrated as opening the Bible, the book that sealed the seven seals, one seal at a time, this work also begins in 1798. In 1798, Christ began to open the, the Bible, the truths that had been buried um, during the Dark Ages, it progressively were the, the, one of the things that's being taught by the Bible being sealed with seven seals in here is that this was a progressive development of truth. What, what William Miller was understanding way back here in 1833, um, they were understanding more than that when they get down to 1842, 1843. It was a progressive development of truth. Thus, the seals are removed one at a time. In Revelation 5, before the seals begin to be removed, please take note that um, John, when he sees this book sealed with seven seals, and we know from the one quote that we referred to last time and then went back to, that the book that is sealed with seven seals is the book of divine instruction. When he sees that the Bible is sealed up, which means it cannot be comprehended by man. He weeps much. He wants, he's, he's illustrating, he's becoming part of the prophecy, and he's illustrating the importance, the importance connected to the fact that, this, that the Bible needs to be opened up to this particular generation. All right? So where we were at in our previous presentation is that we were identifying that in the reform movement of the Millerites at the beginning the book of Daniel is unsealed and according to Daniel 12 at that point there's an increase of knowledge and there's ultimately going to be two classes of worshipers that are developed based upon this increase of knowledge in the terminology of Daniel 12 it's the wise and the wicked and what is identified in Daniel 12 that makes the distinction between the wise and the wicked in this history is that the wise understand the increase of knowledge, but the wicked do not understand the increase of knowledge. So this, this knowledge that's unsealed back here in 1798 at the time of the end, it tests this generation and it produces two classes of worshipers. If you were to summarize, uh, there are probably lots of ways to do this, so that, uh, you could give me several answers, but if you were going to summarize the message of this time, one of the ways that you could summarize the, the Millerite message would be the first angel's message. Miller is the messenger of the first angel's message, even though I'm, I'm not denying they proclaimed the second angel's message. But the first angel's message, <laughs> Revelation 14, if you turn there, verse 6, says, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So if you were to summarize the Millerite message, it would be acceptable to call it the everlasting gospel, correct? And the very first time the gospel is mentioned in the Bible is back in Genesis chapter 3. If you go there with me for a moment. Per verse 15. Because the first time the gospel is mentioned, it's the everlasting gospel from that point all the way through. It's the same gospel. It doesn't get changed. And in Genesis 3.15, it says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And this is a pronouncement against who? Satan. It's a, it's a, and the pronouncement says, is that he's going to put this animosity, this hatred between two entities, so to speak. Between this, the seed of Satan, the seed of the serpent, 
and the seed of Christ, the seed of the woman. And of course it says that Satan is going to um, bruise Christ's heel, which he did at the cross, but Christ is going to crush the serpent's head um, at the end of the millennium. So th that's the everlasting gospel, but what I want you to see there in that verse is that one of the main components of the gospel is a promise that there will be two groups developed. All right? The seed of Satan, the seed of the serpent, and the seed of Christ. Do you see that? Because when you go to this history and you view this reform history here as the Millerite history, and you understand that they were those that proclaimed the first angel's message, then they were those that proclaimed the everlasting gospel. But not only did they proclaim the everlasting gospel, they experienced it. Because when you get to October 22nd, 1844, there are two groups of Millerites. One group, by faith, moves into the most holy place with Christ. The other great group stays in the holy place. And who are they sending their prayers to? Satan. They have become the seed of Satan. The other group has become the seed of Christ. So not only do they proclaim the everlasting gospel, they experience the everlasting gospel. And this is simply another testimony to put with Daniel 12. At the time of the end, there is an increase of knowledge that's going to test this generation. And when this generation reaches its climax, according to Daniel 12, you will have two classes, the wise and the wicked. Of course, we know the parable of the ten virgins was fulfilled in this history. We've read those quotes. At the end of this history, when the door is closed, you have two types of virgins in the parable of the ten virgins. Wise virgins, foolish virgins. So these histories, these reform lines in the biblical testimony is, is that back here at the beginning of this history, there is a unsealing of prophetic light that is going to progressively escalate and test that generation. And this progressive escalation of light is also illustrated when the lion of the tribe of Judah removes the seals from the Bible one at a time. All seven seals. Begins here by the time you get to 1844 all the seals are removed. But as we've already read the seven thunders were sealed up. And the seven thunders whatever they represented, were to be unsealed just before probation closes. Seal not the sayings of the prophecies, prophecy of this book for the time is at hand. Revelation 22.10 So when it comes to the reform movement of the 144,000, just as every other reform movement, there's going to be a prophecy that is fulfilled that marks the time of the end, the beginning of that history. And there's going to be an unsealing prophetic light that is destined to test this generation. And it's going to be a progressive development of truth. That's, that's the premise I'm trying to build before we look at the one chapter. I hope we're all in the same wavelength in terms of the spirit of prophecy. Okay. Uh, I won't even ask the questions I sometimes ask. We all, we all are fully um, accepting of the authority that's contained and the power that's contained in the writings of the spirit of prophecy. The authority that accompanies the spirit of prophecy and the power that is available in the writings of the spirit of prophecy is the same authority and the same power that's provided in the Bible. Um, it's unfortunate that our recent Sabbath School Quarterly would not emphasize some of those simple truths. Same authority, same power. So if we're on that wavelength, then we all know that the book Early Writings is inspired. Okay? But there is one chapter in that book that was not penned by Sister White. Mm, did you know that? That's always a nice place to start. And that's what we're going to deal with is that one chapter which is William Miller's dream. And once we go through William Miller's dream, hopefully we'll be able to place 
this dream in the context of what we've been developing the previous two presentations. On page 17, after Revelation 22, 10 and 11, we have the beginning of William Miller's dream. And I, <coughs> I do this differently and never know how I'm going to do it until we start. Sometimes I'll comment as we go through. Sometimes I'll just read the dream and go back. Well, let's see what happens. Um, I don't know what's the best way necessarily to convey this. There's lots of really nice information in this dream once you fit it in to what we've been looking at so far today. By the way, happy Sabbath. And welcome to some of you that have just arrived. Some of you from way far away and some of you from fairly close. And some of you, I don't know where you came from, but welcome. I dreamed that God, by an unseen hand, sent me a curiously wrought casket about 10 inches long by 6 square made of ebony and pearls curiously inlaid. Now, you, you, if you're going to understand this, you need to remember, Sister White did not pen this. This was a dream of William Miller's. This is William Miller's dream. So, he's the one that's having this dream and he... He sees this curiously wrought casket, which would probably better understood in our modern terminology as a box. All right, But a casket is a box, so it fits. I dreamed that God, by an unseen hand, sent me a curiously wrought casket about 10 inches long by 6 square, made of ebony and pearls, curiously inlaid. To the casket, there was a key attached. Now, if you turn to the next page, page 18, you'll see a comment by James White at the bottom of the page called Casket, Key, and Rubbish. Um, it's, this is James White. He says, The casket represents the great truths of the Bible relative to the second advent of our Lord. It says, Out Lord. I don't know why. The second advent of our Lord Jesus Christ, which were given Brother Miller to publish to the world. The key attached was his manner of interpreting the prophetic word, comparing scripture with scripture, the Bible, its own interpreter. With this key, Brother Miller opened the casket, or the great truth of the advent to the world. The dirt shavings, dirt and shaving sand and all manner of rubbish represents the various and numerous errors that have been brought in among seventh, second advent believers since the autumn of 1844. So if we go back to the beginning of Miller, Miller's dream, it says, I dreamed that God, by an unseen hand, sent me a curiously wrought casket about 10 inches long by 6 square. Um, do we have any mathematicians in the room? 360. 10 by 6 by 6. Why in the world are we given the dimensions of this box, which James White says is the great truth of God's word? Why do we need to know those dimensions? And why is it that they add up to 360? Because the main truth that guided William Miller to the message that he put together was the year-day principle of Bible prophecy that a day represented a year and how many days are in a year biblically. 360. Okay, so this, the 360, the year-day principle is specifically identified if you will see it. If you won't see it, you won't see it. To the casket there was a key attached which sister, which James White has said that he understood represented the rules of prophetic interpretation adopted by William Miller. And Sister White places her endorsement on the rules of prophetic interpretation adopted by William Miller also. And um, it's those rules that allowed him to open God's word to assemble the truths that are represented on that chart that are identified in our previous presentation as the foundations of Adventism. I immediately took the key and opened the casket when, to my wonder and surprise, I found it, found it filled with all sorts and sizes of jewels, diamonds, precious stones, and gold and silver coin of every dimension and value, beautifully arranged in their several places in the casket. And thus arranged, they reflected a light and glory equaled only to the sun. So when he saw these truths, um, they were amazing to him. If you go to um, page 19, at the bottom of p 
page 19 you'll see a, a big quote it, with the subtitle a similar work from Review and Herald June 4th 1889 it says in the time of the Savior the Jew, Jews had so covered the precious jewels of truth with the rubbish of tradition and fable that it was impossible to distinguish the true from the false. So if you go back to William Miller's dream I would submit to you that the jewels and diamonds are the truths of God's word that, that he is putting together at the Lord's direction by using the key which is the rules of prophetic interpretation adopted by William Miller as he opens up the casket with the year day principle 360 and puts together the truths that represent the foundations of Adventism. When did he begin this work? In terms of the reform, uh, not, uh, not technically. William Miller, I'm not marking that William Miller began the work in 1798, but the work of opening up the casket in this reform movement began in 1798 when the book was unsealed, Daniel was unsealed, and also when the line of the tribe of Judah began to remove the seals one by one. Correct? You following the logic here? If so, say amen. amen. Okay. So let me add one more thing into your memory bank before we move on. Before the line of the tribe of Judah unsealed the book of Daniel, what happened? Before. John wept much. Okay. Before, before it happens, we see John weeping because no man is found worthy to open the book, okay? Paragraph 2 of William Miller's dream. He, these truths are, are equal to the glory of the sun. I thought it was not my duty to enjoy this wonderful sight alone, although my heart was overjoyed at the brilliancy, beauty, and value of its contents. I therefore placed it on the center table in my room and gave out word that all who had desire might come and see the most glorious and brilliant sight ever seen by man in this life. So William Miller now it seems like is going into public ministry with his message. The people begin to come in at first few in number but increasing to a crowd. Just because some of us are kind of familiar with Millerite history when did they begin to come in in increasing numbers? A August 11th 1840 with the fulfillment of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and the confirmation of the year day principle then the message suddenly becomes more serious for mankind because they know what the Millerites are preaching about the end of the world it's possible the year day principle works okay but before that time few in number so this is where we're at in his story the people began to come in at first few in number but increasing to a crowd when they first looked into the casket they would wonder and shout for joy but when the spectators increased everyone would begin to trouble the jewels taking them out of the casket and scattering them on the table I begin to think that the owner would require the casket and the jewels again at my hand and if I suffered them to be scattered I could never place them in their places in the casket again as before and felt I should never be able to meet the accountability for it would be immense uh, they then began to plead with the people not to handle them nor to take them out of the casket but the more I pleaded the more they scattered now they seemed to scatter them all over the room on the floor and on every piece of furniture in the room so what's happening the jewels are being scattered but what are the jewels what truth yes but what truth the truth that William Miller had been used to put in place and what are the truths of William Miller that had been that he had been used to put in place the the truths that are reflected on that 1843 chart there came a point in time where those truths began to be scattered and buried with rubbish all right is that a fair reading next paragraph I then saw that among the genuine jewels uh oh something even worse is going to happen I then saw among the genuine jewels or the genuine truths and coin they had scattered an innumerable quantity of spurious jewels and counterfeit coin they're not just covering them up now they're bringing in false doctrine is that, is that fair reading? Yeah. 
I was highly incensed at their base conduct and ingratitude and reproved and reproached them for it. But the more I reproved, the more they scattered the spurious jewels and false coin among the genuine. I then became vexed in my physical soul and began to use physical force to push them out of the room. But while I was pushing out one, three more would enter and bring in dirt and shavings and sand and all manner of rubbish until they covered every one of the true, jewel, true jewels, diamonds and coins which were all excluded from sight. They also tore in pieces my casket and scattered it among the rubbish. What was this casket? It's, it's, the truth, it's the truth of God's word that, that he had direct connection with putting together. I mean, if you had to illustrate those truths, how would, where could you do it? You can just point to that chart. That's, that's, that chart represents the truths that he's talking about here. And what did they do? But while I was pushing one out, three more would enter and bring in dirt, sh sh dirt and shavings and sand and all manner of rubbish until they covered every one of the true jewels, diamonds and coins, which were all excluded from sight. They also tore in pieces my casket and scattered it among the rubbish. I thought no man regarded my sorrow, sorrow or anger. I became wholly discouraged and disheartened and sat down and wept. Now, brothers and sisters, Earlier on, some of you have come into this meeting for the first time. But earlier on, we've identified, and if you're wondering why I'm pointing to this reform movement and just casually putting the dates of Millerite history on here, is because I'm, I'm using this as a representation of all the different reform movements. And I'm familiar enough with the dates of the Millerite movement and hope that you are too, that that I'm using this for Miller right now, but I can use it for others at, at other points in time. Um, earlier, we identified that the history from 1798, which was the time of the end for the Millerites, until 1844, which is when judgment arrived, October 22nd, 1844, that this history is the history of the first and second angel's message, and therefore based upon the passage from the spirit of prophecy, which is in your notes, that this history represents the seven thunders. But the seven thunders, John was told to seal up. And how is it that God's truth becomes sealed? It's through the traditions and customs and teachings of man that are handed down from generation to generation. So what I'm saying is that this history the history of the Millerites, by the time we get to the end of the world, the time when the Lord is about to raise up the 144,000, this history, and therefore the truths that were the foundation to this history, they've been covered up and buried. And that's what this, this history of the foundational truths being covered up and buried is the history that William Miller is identifying here. But now he's at the point in his dream where he does what? He weeps. And what began the Millerite history? It's when John wept. And then the lion of the tribe of Judah began to unseal the prophetic message for that generation. And therefore what I'm saying is when we're seeing William Miller weeping here, he's pointing forward to the point in time when the lion of the tribe of Judah is going to unseal the message for the 144,000. This is just for future reference for where we're going Sunday. Let me point something out. It may not fit in. It may not l connect well because I'm not going to take a lot of time to explain it, but I do want to put it out there. This history from 1798 to 1844 is the history where the Lion of the tribe of Judah opened the prophetic message for that generation one seal at a time. He opened the book that was sealed. And how many seals was that book sealed with? Seven. He opens the first seal here, second seal here. In this illustration, I'm not... I'm not I'm not trying to teach what the pioneers understood the historical fulfillment of the seals were. I agree with them. And what I'm telling you here does not deny them. But at this simple level, 
where the lion of the tribe of Judah is portraying that he opens and removes these seals from the Bible one at a time. He's teaching at that level a progressive unfolding of truth and by the time you get to 1844 the prophetic message for that generation has been fully opened. The everlasting gospel has been accomplished on that generation. The wise and the wicked of Daniel 12 are demonstrated from that generation. Therefore, in this history, seven seals are removed that are illustrating the progressive unfolding truth. You follow that logic? Okay, so, so, so here's the part that you may not follow and I'm just going to put it out there. This history is the history of the seven thunders. So in one sense, the seven seals are the seven thunders. Okay, just keep that in the back of your mind for where we're going to be on Sunday, all right? Okay, um, Okay. now back to Miller, William Miller's dream. Top of page 18, second paragraph. While I was thus weeping, and what happened to John in chapter 5 of Revelation when he wept? Then the lion of the tribe of Judah appears because he's prevailed to open the book that no man could open. While I was thus weeping and mourning for my great loss and accountability, I remembered God and earnestly prayed that he would send me help. Immediately the door opened and a man entered the room when the people all left it and he having a dirt brush in his hand opened the windows and began to brush the dirt and rubbish from the room. I cried to him to forbear, for there were some precious jewels scattered among the rubbish. He told me to fear not, for he would take care of them. Who's the dirt brush man? How, how do you understand that? Where do you see him roaring in as a lion here? Where, where do you identify Jesus out of those, as the dirt brush man out of those three paragraphs? For me, the easy one is the fact whoever the dirt brush man, he's the man that says, fear not. Who is it that says fear not in the scriptures? This is Christ. Sister White identifies the dirt brush man as Christ. And she also identifies Christ as the lion of the tribe of Judah. So he's doing the same thing here with the dirt brush that he's doing when he's removing the seven seals. He's sweeping the traditions and customs that have been handed down from generation to generation that had covered up the foundational truths that were gathered together by William Miller. He's sweeping them out the window. Then, while he brushed the dirt and the rubbish and false jewels, jewels and counterfeit coin all, coin, all rose and went out of the window like a cloud, and the wind carried them away. In the bustle, I closed my eyes for a moment... When I opened them, the rubbish was all gone. The precious jewels, the diamonds, the gold, and the silver coins lay scattered in profusion all over the room. He then placed on the table a casket, much larger and more beautiful. And some, some of you know this trick question, do not answer. Okay, don't answer. He then placed on the table a casket much larger and more beautiful than the former and gathered up all the jewels, the diamonds, the coins by the handful and cast them into the casket till not one was left although some of the diamonds were not bigger than the point of a, of a pin. The dirt brush man not only sweeps away the traditions and customs that have come into Adventism since the, since the Millerite movement but then he gathers up those foundational truths and he puts them back in the box where they're supposed to be. Only this time, the box isn't 10 by 6 by 6. It's bigger. Why is it bigger? I, you got, I told you, I forewarned you, you guys that already know this trick question not to say. That's right. Because at the end of the world, the box is not simply the Bible at the end of the world. It's the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. It's bigger. He then placed on the table a casket much larger and more beautiful than the former and gathered up the jewels, the diamonds, the coins by the handful and cast them into the casket till not one was left, although some of the diamonds were not bigger than the point of a pin. He then called upon me to come and see. I looked into the casket but my eyes were dazzled with the sight. 
they shone with ten times their former glory. How, how bright did William Miller's truth shine at the beginning of this dream? As bright as the sun. Now they're shining ten times as bright as the sun. But were all William Miller's jewels back in that box? All of them were. Not one was left. I mean, but, but do, do we accept that? I mean, were all these truths put back in the box? Or just, not necessarily the 2520 though, right? Or, or not maybe, not, not the Millerite understanding of the trumpets. Maybe that, that, that jewel wasn't put back in there, was it? I mean, well, certainly we know the daily wasn't put back in there. All the jewels were put back in the box. According to this dream. I looked into the casket, but my eyes were dazzled with the sight. They shone with ten times their former glory. I thought they had been scoured in the sand by the feet of those wicked persons who had scattered and trod them in the dust. They were arranged in beautiful order in the casket, every one in its place, without any visible pains of the man who cast them in. I shouted with j very joy, and that shout awoke me. When William Miller, when these truths, brothers and sisters, when these truths are reassembled, or in the, in the terminology of Isaiah and Jeremiah, when the 144,000 return to the old paths, when the 144,000 return to the foundational truths, and they do so because the Lion of the tribe of Judah is unsealing these truths to that generation. When they returned to the foundations, they reached the time period that we know as the loud cry. But in that time period, the parable of the ten virgins is being fulfilled. Again, correct. And how many of the virgins slept? All of them. But in that history, when the midnight cry in the Millerite history was fulfilled, and the loud cry in our history is fulfilled, the loud cry is the shout that takes place when they wake up. William Miller's dream is the history of Adventism from the time period that the foundational truths were put in place. Covering the time period when the foundational truths are buried up with the rubbish of human opinion unto the very time that the Lion of the tribe of Judah decides it's time to unseal the prophetic message for the generation of the 144,000. And brothers and sisters, the fact that we're discussing these very things here tells you that we've reached that time period. We're here. And when you've reached that time period, according to Jeremiah, there will be those among us that say, we will not walk in the old path, nor will we listen to the message of the trumpet. You, you have to save your questions to the end was the, was the council at the beginning. A and yes, and one of, the, one of the purposes of that, among other things, is to get the questions on tape. And the question that she raised from the floor was, do I think that some of the conference churches or officers are going to accept this message? And I don't, I don't know everywhere on planet Earth where people are grappling with this message but I do know of some and I know of some places on planet earth where this message is getting taught and promoted where it's being taught and promoted by conference employees um, and the page of uh, page 19 in the middle of the page under ancient Israel it says, Christ is the originator of all truth. This is from Signs of the Times, May 1st, 1901. Christ is the originator of all truth. By the work of the enemy, the precious gems of truth have been torn from their setting and placed in a framework of error. Had been. 
Christ came to replace the jewels of truth in their rightful position. He rescued them from, their, from the rubbish of error, gave them a new power, and bade them to stand fast forever. He could use these truths with perfect freedom, for he was their author. He had cast them into the minds of each generation. And when he came to the world, he revitalized and rearranged the truth which Satan had robbed of life, clothing them with more than their original freshness and power. He gave them to the world for the benefit of future generations. In these reform lines, the work that Christ accomplishes in each of these generations as the lion of the tribe of Judah is he unseals a prophetic message that will test that generation. That's what's happening today. He is once again unsealing a message that will ultimately produce two classes of worshipers in Adventism. In the terminology of Matthew 25, it's the wise and foolish virgins. In the terminology of Daniel 12, it's the wise and the wicked. Page 20. Top of the page, the Millerites. The great disappointment in 1844 was a trying ordeal. They had not the light that would have enabled them to discern the reason of their disappointment. Some gave up their faith, others held to their past experience, but became bewildered in regard to the position after 1844. They were exposed to temptation and received various errors as Bible truth. But I was shown that the Lord would, in his providence, clear away the rubbish of error and reveal to them the jewels of truth. Today, Manuscript Releases, Volume 1, page 40. Mighty truths have been buried beneath the sophistry of error, but they will be found by the diligent searcher. As he finds and opens the treasure house of the precious jewels of truth, it is no robbery, for all who appreciate these jewels may possess them, and then they too have a treasure house to open to others. He who in part does not deprive himself of the treasure, for as he examines it, he that he may present it in such a way as to attract others, he finds new treasures. Publishing Minister's Ministry, page 68. The scriptures are given for our benefit that we may have instruction in righteousness. Precious rays of light have been obscured by the clouds of error, but Christ is ready to sweep away the mist and error of superstition and to reveal to us the brightness of his Father's glory so that we shall say as did the disciples, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way. And sometimes people will be listening to the prophetic message and it's a problem because they don't hear Christ being um, lifted up or identified. But brothers and sisters, as we're talking about the lion of the tribe of Judah unsealing the truths, that the special truths that have been buried up and unsealing them for this generation, when you and I are looking at these truths that are being unsealed, we may, in our hardened hearts think that all we're doing is being confronted with some very nice information from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy but Sister White just told us here that those truths that we're reading and considering and putting together that it's the voice of Christ speaking to us just as he was speaking to the disciples on the road to Emmaus and it's the disciples on the road to Emmaus did not understand that the prophetic message that was being opened to them was the voice of Christ. The prophetic message is the voice of Christ. To hold your counsels on Sabbath school work, page 29, to hold yourself aloof from an investigation of truth is not the way to carry out the Savior's, Savior's injunction to search the scriptures. It is dig digging for hidden treasures to call the result of someone... Is it digging, digging for hidden treasures to call the results of someone's labor a mass of rubbish and make no critical examination to see whether or not there are precious jewels of truth in the collection of thought which you condemn? Will those who have almost everything to learn keep themselves away from every meeting where there is an opportunity to investigate the messages that come to the people simply because they imagine the views held by the teachers of truth may be out of harmony with what they have 
conceived as truth. Thus it was that the Jews did in the days of Christ. And we are warned not to do as they did and be led to choose darkness rather than light because there was in them an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. Not one of those who imagine that they know it is all not one of those who imagine that they know it all is too old or too intelligent to learn from the humblest of the messengers of the living God. So there is no way that uh, there's there's a ch available chair back here, brother. You want to come in? Oh, okay, okay. There's no way in this short weekend to cover all the material that would be pertinent to cover here. Um, but one of the things that we that I do want to put in place here, if you turn to Daniel. chapter 11 verse 40 and we have a, a, once again my wife is Kathy raise your hand please and we have a magazine that's available and a, any of the materials that we have and I'm not trying to sell anything and I'm not trying to sell anything on Sabbath but any of the things that we have available for sale at our ministry um, we're willing to provide for you without any shipping because we didn't bring materials with us. If, if, if I mention something during the weekend and you want to take advantage of that, um, if, if you purchase it, we'll get it mailed to you, no shipping cost. And one of the, the things that I'm going to mention to you is a, a magazine called The Time of the End. And The Time of the End magazine covers the last six verses of Daniel 11. And we do not have time to, to go in detail through the last six verses of Daniel 11. Maybe someone could do it in this weekend, but when I do the last six verses of Daniel 11, it usually takes me about 10 hours just for that. Okay, so w well I don't have the time here for that. Uh, but that magazine will cover it. And so if you go to Daniel 11 verse 40, which is the first of those last six verses, I want to just point something out to you. In verse 40 it says, and at the time of the end. And to keep it simple, in Great Controversy, page 356, Sister White says the time of the end is 1798. Okay? In the Millerite history, the time of the end was 1798. Everyone with me? Okay. I was once taught by someone that teaches preaching that when you lose your audience, and from my perspective, I lost my audience here momentarily, that one of the things to do is just keep quiet. Okay. The time of the end of the Millerite history was 1798. There was a prophecy that was fulfilled, and the prophecy was that the papacy received the deadly wound. All right. With the fulfillment of that prophecy, there was light shed upon this coming generation with the increase of knowledge, and that light had to do with the coming judgment. Verse 40 of Daniel 11 is dealing with 1798 at the time of the end. And it says, And at the time of the end shall the king of the south, and the king of the south at the time of the end is atheistic France. In 1798, the king of the south, atheistic France, will push. And that Hebrew word that's translated as push means to make war against. In 1798, atheistic France was going to make war against the king of the north. And the king of the north in this passage is the papacy. If you've ever considered that the papacy receives a deadly wound in Bible prophecy and you want to know which verse in the Bible is identifying when and where the papacy received the deadly wound, it's Daniel 11 verse 40. When atheistic France, the king of the south, began a war against the papacy in 1798, that's Daniel 11 verse 40 and that's the time of the end for the Millerites. But the verse goes on to say, it says, shall the king of the south push at him and the king of the north, the papacy, shall come against him, the king of the south, as a whirlwind, with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. The king of the south, the, the king of atheism, in 1798 was atheistic France. But as history progressed in this verse, the king of atheism in 1917 became the Soviet Union. And this is identifying that in time, the papacy would return and retaliate against the Soviet Union and 
whoever the king of the south is when the papacy retaliates it's a power that is made up of many countries because that's what the verse says it says she'll overflow and pass over the countries in the plural and sure enough when the Soviet Union was swept away in 1989 it was made up of many countries but the verse says that when the king of the north the papacy retaliates against the king of the south the king of atheism that it will bring with it chariots ships and horsemen and this tells the student of prophecy that it brings an ally because if you have your concordance with you and you look chair up chariots and horsemen you will find that chariots and horsemen in bible prophecy represent military strength and in prophecy and in history the papacy never has its own army it always uses someone else's army so for the papacy to return and sweep away the king of atheism and bring chariots and horsemen with it it means it had to have an ally, ally that supplied military strength but it also brings ships with it and ships in Bible prophecy is economic strength and of course we know as Seventh-day Adventists the ally of the papacy at the end of the world according to Revelation 13 that supplies military and economic might is the United States because in Revelation 13 the United States forces the world to accept the mark of the beast so that they can buy or sell that's your ships that's your economic strength or you're put to death that's your chariots and horsemen that's your military strength that's the United States verse 40 is saying that when the Soviet Union was swept away in 1989 through the alliance of the papacy in the United States which is a documented alliance that everyone in this room except the young children were witness to not that long ago that the sweeping away of the Soviet Union was co accomplished by an alliance between the United States and the Vatican so what's really profound about this particular verse verse 40 verse 40 starts in 1798 which is the time of the end for the reform movement of the Millerites it's the time of the end for the seven thunders which is the history of the first and second angels message but by the time you get to the end of the verse you've reached 1989 and 1989 is a fulfillment of prophecy that marks the time of the end for the 144,000 because with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989 in fulfillment of verse 40 it tells the student of prophecy and Adventism that the last six verses of Daniel 11 have begun to unfold and verse 41 is identifying nothing else but a Sunday law in the United States now brothers and sisters there's not very many people in Adventism that understand the last six verses of Daniel 11 as I'm identifying them for you. But verse 45 in Daniel 11, it's followed immediately with Daniel 12.1. Look at Daniel 12.1. Daniel 12.1 says, And at that time shall Michael stand up. Does everyone in here understand what is represented by Michael standing up? the close of human probation so verse 1 of Daniel 12 it starts with the words and at that time in other words somewhere in the previous verses probation closes in fact I would challenge anyone in this room or anyone in Adventism to show me a clearer illustration of the close of probation than is illustrated right here in Daniel 12.1 Daniel 12.1 is the clearest illustration of the close of probation and it's connected to these verses that lead up to it verses 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45 and if you go to 21 of your notes you'll see something very interesting from the great controversy on the top of page 21 it says the events connected with the close of probation what are the events connected with the close of probation? Well, if Daniel 12.1 is the close of probation, then the events connected with the close of probation are the last six verses of Daniel 11. And she says here, the events connected with the close of probation and the work of preparation for the time of trouble are clearly presented. But, multitudes, would, would it be fair to use for the word multitudes 
the majority but multitudes have no more understanding of these important truths what important truths the events connected with the close of probation what important truths the last six verses of Daniel 11 that lead to the close of probation. Multitudes have n no more understanding of these important truths than if they'd never been revealed. How important are these truths? Notice the next sentence. Satan watches to catch away every impression that would make them wise unto salvation. These truths are what we would call salvational Satan watches to catch away every impression that would make them wise unto salvation and the time of trouble will find them unready so what I'm saying to you brothers and sisters is that in 1989 with the collapse of the Soviet Union there was a prophecy fulfilled and the time of the end in every reform movement begins with a fulfillment of a prophecy and that fulfillment of that particular prophecy cast light upon the next generation, this reform movement. The time of the end in the time of Christ was the birth of Christ. With the birth of Christ, it cast prophetic light upon that generation. And the message for that generation is that the Messiah was to come and confirm the covenant with many for one week. What announced that that history had arrived was the birth of the Messiah. A prophecy was fulfilled. The time of the end for that generation arrived. A prophecy was unsealed. That light, the arrival of the Messiah, was going to test that generation. Was the generation when Christ walked among men tested by the fact that the Messiah was there? Yes. Yeah. Daniel chapter 7 says first the papacy receives a deadly wound then comes the judgment in 1798 in fulfillment of prophecy the papacy receives a deadly wound marks the time of the end for the Millerites and the light that is opened up is the next thing that's going to happen is judgment in agreement with Daniel chapter 7 did the Millerites announce the opening of the judgment did the light of that message test the Millerites Every reform movement, every reform movement begins with the fulfillment of prophecy and the fulfillment of the prophecy sheds light on that generation. And what we're saying, brothers and sisters, in 1989, in fulfillment of Daniel 11, verse 40, the Soviet Union collapsed, identifying that the next conquering that the king of the north of the papacy was going to do was represented in verse 41 as a Sunday law in the United States. And then in verses 42 and 43, the papacy would conquer Egypt, which is the entire world. And of course, that's what Sister White says. Sister White says the Sunday law first comes to the United States, and then every country on the globe follows his example. But brothers and sisters, the Millerites were the messengers of the first angel's message. We're not. Who are we the messengers of? The third angel's message. Fourth angel's going to join it. I don't deny that. But our message is a message to the world about receiving the mark of the beast, is it not? And with the collapse of the Soviet Union in fulfillment of Daniel 11 verse 40, the student of prophecy and Adventism knows, okay, now the movements that are going to place the papacy on the throne of the earth and bring the Sunday law testing time, they are underway. The fulfillment of that prophecy cast light upon this generation that was to test them and produce two classes of worshipers and Adventism and the time of the end had arrived for the generation of the 144,000. Notice verse 44. By the way, we mentioned this earlier. Last quote on page 21. The events of the future will be discerned by prophecy and will be understood. Prophecy is understood in advance, not simply when it's fulfilled. Daniel 11 verse 44. Uh, I'm just in the Bible now. I'm, I, I'm done with these notes. Talking about the truth that is unsealed for the reform movement of the 144,000. 1989, 
the last six verses of Daniel 11, which are the events that are connected with the close of to the close of probation that have been clearly revealed that multitudes have no understanding of, that Satan is attempting to keep away from people understanding. Sister White says these truths would make them wise unto salvation. So these truths are salvational. And in verse 44, verse 40, the collapse of the Soviet Union. Verse 41, the Sunday law in the United States. Verse 42 and 43, the whole world is conquered by the papacy. But in verse 44 it says, but tidings out of the east. Tidings is a message. Tidings out of the east and the north shall trouble him, shall trouble who? The papacy. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly make away many. There's a message from the east and the north that is proclaimed by Adventism that enrages the papacy. Okay, the message of the east as lightning shineth from the east unto the west. The east represents the second coming of Christ. Sister White says soon there appears in the east a cloud. This, the shape of a man's hand. This, the size of a man's hand. And, this, and the saints know that to be the sign of what? The coming of the Son of Man. East represents the second coming of Christ. In Isaiah 41, Christ is the righteous man that comes from the east and the north. Christ's righteousness is represented by east and north. And of course, we know the third angel's message is the message of Christ's righteousness. It's also the message of his second coming. But the message of the east is also the sealing message, is it not? Revelation 7. Go to Revelation 7 and we'll, we'll bring this to a close. Revelation 7 verse 1 says, and after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth holding the four winds of the earth that the wind should not blow on the earth nor on the sea nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east. The sealing message comes from the east. Okay. Now the sealing message comes from the east. Some of you weren't here earlier. We want to put this, we want to put this in place one more time for some of the newbies here. Okay. Verse 2, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we've sealed the servants of God in our forehead. These four angels are restraining the four winds until God's people are sealed, correct? And the message, the, the, this angel, is it, is it okay to call an angel a messenger? <laughs> the same word all right just depends on how the translators want to say it so the message from the east is the sealing message and it's the message of the restraining of the four winds and of course we've already dealt with this but let's read it one more time angels are holding the four winds represented as an angry horse seeking to break loose and rush over the face of the whole earth bearing death and destruction in its path for a long time we thought that was in Selected Messages book 3 page 407 I believe but then we went and we looked where it came from originally so for those of you that are just getting here for this presentation go to verse 9 of Ezekiel 37 Ezekiel 37 which is the vision of the dead dry bones where the which Sister White says the dead dry bones are the Seventh-day Adventist church. You don't need that. In verse 11, when the bones come to life, in verse 11, Ezekiel says, Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Who's the house of Israel at the end of the world? It's the Seventh-day Adventist church. You don't need Sister White to tell you that the dead dry bones are the Seventh-day Adventist church. You can do it right here in Ezekiel. And Ezekiel's taken to a valley of dead dry bones and asked, Can these bones live? And he says, I don't know, Lord, you know. And he's told prophesy to these bones. And we're saying that it is prophecy. The prophetic message that brings the revival to Adventism that we understand to be the latter rain. The sealing message. And Ezekiel is speaking about the end of the world as are all the other prophets. And the prophecy that finally brings these bones to life is portrayed in verse 9. And it says, Then he said, to, said unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds. The 
prophecy that brings this army to life that is Adventism at the end of the world comes from the four winds. This is, this is the four winds of Revelation 7. It says, This saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. Now, if you don't think the four winds here in verse 9 are the four winds in Revelation 7, then let me read you the original place where Sister White makes her comment about the four winds. This is Manuscript Releases, Volume 20, page 217. She says, Angels are holding the four winds, represented as an angry horse. And of course, we're identifying the angry horse as Islam. The angry horse that is represented on these two charts by these war horses is Islam of the fifth trumpet, sixth trumpet. Islam of the fifth trumpet, sixth trumpet. Both these charts have been endorsed by the spirit of prophecy as being of the Lord. And we're saying this horse represents Islam. We're saying that the four winds that are restrained when the sealing of the 144,000 begins is the restraining of Islam. And Sister White says in Manuscript Releases, Volume 20, page 217, angels are holding the four winds represented as an angry horse seeking to break loose and rush over the face of the whole earth bearing de destruction and death in its path. But she continues on and she says this, Shall we sleep on the verge, the very verge of the eternal world? Shall we be dull and cold and dead? Oh, that we might have in our churches the spirit and the breath of God breathed into his people that they might stand upon their feet and live. This is Ezekiel 7, verse 39, 37, verse 9. She's, verse 30, chapter 7, verse 9 says, Thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds. Mr. White says this is the angry horse. Bring a prophecy of Islam. O oh, breathe and breathe upon these slain that they might live. Verse 10, so I prophesied as he commanded me and the breath came into them and they lived and they stood upon their feet in exceeding mighty army. And we're also, also saying, brothers and sisters, that the message that brought power into the Millerites was the message of the sixth trumpet, which was Islam, that was fulfilled on August 11th, 1840. And we're saying the Millerite history is repeated at the very end. To so to say that the trumpet message of the second woe is what empowered the Millerites, and that the trumpet message of the third woe is what's to empower God's people in the sealing time of the 144,000. It's airtight. Shall we pray? <coughs> Heavenly Father we understand that in every reformatory movement that you open special truths to your people and that one of the things that takes place when that is accomplished is that your people have to recognize the need of these truths being opened unto them as illustrated by John and William Miller weeping we need to understand our need, Lord, and we ask that you make that happen in each of our individual experiences. That you'd give us a sense of urgency, a sense of desire to know what you have allowed to be sealed up for this final time period. That we might be serious about our work as students of prophecy to seek these truths out. That you might accomplish the purpose that you intend through this that you might pour your spirit upon us and that we might stand up and be that mighty army that finishes the work and goes home with you but we know along with this testimony that this takes place in a time of, sh of shaking and Adventism and we ask that you would give us the discernment and the courage to to listen to your voice and test these things that we're understanding that we might be among those that you can place your blessing upon at this time period in earth's history. We thank you for the Sabbath that has begun. We ask for a, a special blessing, a double blessing upon the Sabbath time. We ask that you'd help us to keep our, our thoughts, our conversations in accordance with these sacred hours. And please bless us for this weekend, this Sabbath, that this 
can be a mountaintop experience that we carry with us until you return in the clouds of heaven in the very near future, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so now we're going to open to questions. So, any questions? I guess you did a pretty good job then. <laughs> okay. I was informed by a sister that you have some new understanding of Islam, and I want to know if you're going to share that with us this weekend. Well, I've been doing a little bit of that. Uh, the, the idea that the children of the East is the message of the East and North in Daniel 11, 44. Um, and that it's the message of the four winds, Ezekiel 37, verse 9, is easily connected with the message of the four winds of Revelation 7, verses 1 through 3. Um, there's, there's some interesting truths along that line that, we've, that some of us have been looking at, and I had hoped to get those all organized where I could present some of those here. I never got to that point, so I'm touching some of them that I just can't keep away from, but um, the, probably the easy answer is no. <laughs> this is basically <laughs> a, a, a touching on just some, did, did I lead you to believe that in an email or something? Where did you hear that from? Hold it, hold it. Okay, so it's not my fault that you drove all this way, because I didn't say that. I, I said it to one person and one person only, and later I emailed them and said, hey, maybe you don't want to come here because I did not have time to, to get these thoughts together. No, I, I have to. I have to. I have to go through some try. Yeah, I know you did. Uh, yeah, I think. <laughs> I think what Jeff is trying to tell us is that he's going to be back. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. What, uh, what, uh, what I'm trying to tell you is that <laughs> there's the people that put on this meeting. They ask for certain things to be addressed too. That um, who told you that? How did, how did that? How did that get to you? In Oregon. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Yeah. Yeah, but this is an irrelevant question. She went. To, she's. She has heard, and I. I can't believe that she heard that. That some of us have been understanding some, some more information about Islam and Bible prophecy. Uh, uh, <laughs> I only said it to one person. Okay. You so you've been hearing the, the basis of, of a lot of it with Ezekiel 37.9. Uh, Ezekiel 37.9 is airtight locked in with Revelation 7 now. And it's also a secondary argument that the angry horse is Islam. It's, it, these, these little bits and pieces that we've been understanding, they're just getting more and more cemented as we march down the stream of time. But now that the cat is out of the bag, that means that you have to come back. No, <laughs> that's not what it means. <laughs> no, I, I, I am certain that you're at the time period in Earth's history when everyone is to be teachers. Uh, and I, I'm certain that I, sh I need to quit coming back anywhere. I need to go home. All right. And stay home. Okay. <laughs> uh, anyone that's understanding this message, it, 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 in William Miller's dream, there's er, one of those quotes in there. It's time that God's people that understand this message take up the work and become the teachers. Amen. Yes. Yeah, it, we're doing, we're participating in a camp meeting that's being put on by Jamal Sankey's ministry in Goleta area, Goleta solving area of Calvary. No, I think that got switched to closer to the ocean, didn't it? That is right by the ocean. Oh, it is? Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Just beyond. Yeah. Yeah, it's up in the mountains from there. Yeah. From Goleta. Yes. That, it was a cam meeting that went through a couple changes, but now they're going to... It's in between Solvang and Goleta in the mountains. It's a campground. 
Yeah, but, but, but the camp is like 22 miles from Goleta and 7 miles from Solvang. Yes. And you're going to ask about time prophecy? No? no? no. Okay. I still have another question on Daniel 7 too. What is the, the message the, the message that came from the beast? I'm sorry, Revelation 7 2. Revelation 7 2. Okay, well, what I have, for a lot, if you read the Time of the End magazine, and you may not have followed me, I said a lot in the last presentation. The Time of the End magazine covers the last six verses of Daniel 11. And in that magazine, through concordance study, by, by taking the word east and the north, when we're dealing with Daniel 11, verse 44, you can demonstrate that the east and the north in Bible prophecy represent certain things. The east represents the sealing message. You get that from Revelation 7. But the east also represents the second coming of Christ. As lightning shineth from the east to the west. And okay. it's, but in Isaiah 41, in Isaiah 41, let, let go there. Because there you have both east and, and north combined. Um, and it's there what's being emphasized is the righteousness of Christ. Um, you'll notice in verse um, Isaiah 41 verse 2 says, Who raised up the righteous man from the east? Okay, verse 2, this is of Isaiah 41. Who raised up the righteous man from the east? This is Christ. Um, you know, it's also Cyrus, but Cyrus is, is a type of Christ. And the righteous man from the east, so the east is representing the righteousness of Christ. But this, this narrative here continues on. If you get to verse 25, it says, I have raised up one from the north, and he shall come from the rising of the sun. And where does the sun rise from? In the east. So the righteous man, when you have east and north together, it's representing the righteousness of Christ. So this message in verse 44 that enrages the papacy just before probation closes, it's the message of Christ's righteousness, which Sister White says the third angel's message is the message of Christ's righteousness. But it's also the message of Christ's second coming, which Sister White also says is the third angel's message. But it's also the sealing message of Revelation 7, which Sister White also says is the third angel's message. And biblically, when judgment came upon God's people, it always came out of the north. The enemies. The, in Old Testament time when they would come and attack Israel they came out of the north so th biblically the north represents judgment okay and the third angel's message judgment message so the message in verse 44 that enrages the papacy and brings about the persecution is the message of the third angel that's swelling to a loud cry um, it's all the things that are made up in the third angel and in, a, in the time of the end magazine we, we lay out all those proof texts for that but recently, what we have come to understand is that this message that is proclaimed, it says tidings from the east and the north, it enrages the papacy. So if there's a message, there has to be people that are the messengers. And so the messengers have to understand what the message of the east and the north is. And the message of the north is that the papacy is the king of the north. And Sister White is clear that the third angel's message is going to expose the corruptions that have come into Babylon since 1844. It's the message that identifies who the Antichrist is and what the mark of his authority is. But the message of the East that brings God's people to life is the message of the children of the East. And the children of the East are the descendants of Ishmael. And Ishmael is the symbol of Islam at the end of the world. And Islam in Bible prophecy is represented as a horse. So when Sister White says that the four winds that are held by the four angels are represented by the angry horse with lots of other arguments. This isn't the other one. When the four winds put a restraint, or a restraint, when the four angels restrained the four winds, it's marking a point in history when Islam is restrained. And immediately after September 11, 2001, George Bush went to the United Nations and to the world and placed a restraint upon Islam and the sealing of the 144,000 began. Uh, 
uh, <laughs> I don't go that far, but I get your, your implication. Um, but we, ha we have some more to say about that. Uh, any other questions? Uh, he, he'll give you a, a schedule if he hasn't. Yeah, sure. if you look in your book that I gave you, the schedule is there. I think lunch, I mean, uh, breakfast is at 8, yeah. and uh, the first meeting starts at 9. So, uh, one more question. Yeah, someone set me up for a question and it never happened. Someone came and says, you're going to get this question. Where's John? Oh, John. I'll get it tomorrow, no doubt. Um, I have a question about a uh, comment that was um, made uh, at the last camp meeting where we're at uh, by Pastor Carrasco. Um, I can't remember where Mrs. White wrote this, but it something to do that um, he will, Satan will put out a deadly taint in the air and, and uh, thousands will die. Do you remember that yeah. quotation? Um, I don't remember him saying that, but I know that quotation. Well, he talked about it in one of the presentation that he was doing yeah. there. Pretty much everything that she had set out, all the things that she had put down first had already happened, but a taint in the air where thousands will die, I don't think that has happened yet. Is that an event to, to still be happening in the future? Well, Am I you know, I, the reason that I'm familiar with this quote, and this, is, uh, this goes back many, many moons ago, I, I didn't know that um, Manny shared that quote because I didn't I wasn't at all his presentation but I remember that quote on two events that have happened the Bhopal chemical dis disaster in India probably 20 years ago there was a, a, a chemical factory in Im India where they released some gas and thousands of people died and then probably 15 years ago I think in Africa there was a volcano that in the middle of the night released a heavy gas that went down into the valley and all all the people that were living around that volcano they died in their sleep do you does anyone remember that okay so I, so i've i've i'm familiar with that quote i don't know that those two events are the fulfillment of that quote but i've seen things in history already that could qualify So he's he's saying, uh, uh, but, but I mean he's uh, the implication is is that that Islam is going to sneak into some city and d dispel some. Ooh, okay. My <laughs> questioning on it. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, but the brother behind you was going to say something about that. I was just Ellen White just says Satan imparts a deadly taint in the air. She doesn't tie it to any specific event, and so if you just take a good quick breath in Los Angeles you'll realize it's fulfilled everywhere it, it's just part of what we go through yeah, but with this one place where she says thousands with oh you're saying they die ultimately from lung cancer from living in yes. LA yes I mean uh, influ <laughs> influzema all that stuff is the direct result of the photochemical reaction there so okay anthrax Okay. <laughs> the anthrax. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Here comes my European. Well, Amtrak <laughs> maybe just. <as> bad. <laughs> but I was thinking of that. That would that would could cause something like devasta devastation. When you find the fulfillment, let us know if it's not apparent for all. I understand that. Uh, Bush got a, a huge amount of money from Congress to fight the bird flu and that uh, there's a DVD out that explains the bird flu is all a big hoax and that basically uh, he also signed into law that uh, if he points the finger at you and say you're infected with this flu that they can take you off into quarantine camps <coughs> and uh, Supposedly this was signed in law. I didn't look into it to verify it, but uh, it could be that uh, they have something in mind. Of course, we all know about uh, the fiberglass coffins that were mass produced. That's if, if you don't know about that, there's a website you can look that up because they're preparing for a great pandemic. So there's there's things that uh, might be happening here in the near future that uh, could be could be called seven last plagues. As Kathy and I were 
were packing up. We were in a hotel this morning, and, and we had Fox News on, and we didn't, we couldn't hear it. It was just on the screen as we're packing up, and and they have the the little subtitles of what they're talking about. The subtitle was, and her and I talked about it, but not not enough to that we heard the the comment. The subtitle was, "Is the United Nations attempting to bring out about a new world order?" And that's the words it used. So I mean, when when the secular news is openly discussing <laughs> these very concepts that we've been identified f in prophecy for years. You know it's reached the level now that that we're almost there. Even an inauguration speech from uh, President Obama, he mentioned, I think, a couple of times, it's a time for a new world order. Not a new world, but he used a new world for a new age or something like this. Yeah, not to change. Yeah, he used that before, but he said it was a time for a new era or a new world. Well, I don't know if anybody's noticed in the last couple of days, but they're talking about the new currency. Yeah, but well now that in the past couple, the the new currency, the new money, the UN, China, even Geithner. So. You know, I may be making this up in my own mind, but in the when when Israel was blessing and prophesying over Israel uh, over uh, Jacob and Esau, did um, didn't um, um, Israel call? Um, Esau, a wild horse, or something like uh, that. That's Genesis sixteen twelve, and that's that's the prophecy. We're going to get to that in our presentation. That's the prophecy of Ishmael, Abraham's firstborn, and it says that he will be a wild man, and that word that is translated wild means the wild Arabian ass. And in the very first mention of the characteristics of Ishmael is there in Genesis sixteen, eleven and twelve. So the, the very first mention in the Bible is an important rule to watch for. And so when it calls him the wild Arabian ass, it's saying that his prophetic DNA is that he's a horse. So when Islam is being illustrated as a horse in Revelation 9, to the extent that when the pioneers prepared these charts, that's how they symbolically represent Islam on these charts, as a, is as a horse. It's that line of prophetic reasoning that we use to put such an emphasis on Sister White's statement where she says the four winds are represented as an angry horse. And, and we will deal with that prophecy. Because it, it says that he's a wild man and his hand will be against every man and every man's hand will be against him. And Bible prophecy teaches that there is going to be a new world order, a one world government. And Islam, the issue, the crisis that Islam raises is what brings every man's hand in the world together against Islam. And when that happens, when that one world government's put in place, then the world will realize, because the Pope will be sitting on top of that one world government, that the papacy wasn't interested in dealing with the problems of Islam. He's going to deal with the problems of the Sabbath keepers. And, and you can show that in Bible prophecy very clearly. That's, that's their role. Their role is to bring the world together against them in order for the one world government to deal with God's people. The, another little identifying marker, as you mentioned, Genesis 16, 12 there about Ishmael. The final phrase is that he dwells in the presence of his brethren and the Muslims do not integrate with other cultures. They remain separate. And so they dwell in the presence of their brethren alone. So that's another marker. But pastor, what's the pastor's name that isn't here now? But it's been, what? Vishado? Vishada. That's one of his forte is Islam and Bible prophecy. And, and we had a, we had meetings yesterday in Loma Linda, and he pointed out about verse twelve something interesting too. That can be understood. That he dwells to the east of his brethren. Okay, that's, that's evidently there in the Hebrew too. The point being is, is that from the very beginning, 
Ishmael and his descendants are identified in Bible prophecy as the children of the east, which connects with the fact that in Revelation 7, the sealing message about the restraining of the four winds comes from the east. Did anybody hear President Obama's address this morning to the nation? Uh, he reiterated the Bush line that they were going to... He did not use the word restrain, but his line on Afghanistan and Al-Qaeda is identical to Bush's. And he's called the world together again to put this restraint on terrorism. It was identical to Bush. Uh, you know, what else I, could he I, do? Well, I, I think his... Uh, Obama's phrase when he was being elected was, yes, we can. And I, I think there's more meaning to that than meets the eye. You know, so if you would have just closed your eyes, it was the sa same identical speech that Bush used to give. So that, that tells me something about well, where they're heading. They're, they're on their mark, and they're staying right on it. There is a guy that published a new video, uh, it's a documentary about Obama's great deception or something like this, Alex Jones, I know he's very controversial, but he analyzed everything Obama said in his campaign and what he's doing right now in the first few months of his uh, uh, government, it's, it's, it's frightening, because he, he's pretty much like Bush, keeping the same idea, but he, he's very charismatic. Everybody wants to listen to him. So it's a, it's a good, it's an hour and 50 minutes documentary, but it's Alex. He's very controversial. So uh, can I say something here? And uh, I've participated in this, but I'm going to throw this out. I'm going to throw some cold water on some things here. As you teach the prophetic message in Adventism, you find that there's a lot of stumbling blocks that, that Satan puts in the way from God's people understanding the prophetic message. Several different ones. They come in a variety of ways. And one of them is, is that most of us in Adventism that have any inclination to study prophecy are the same, have the same character tendencies of those of us in Adventism that like to keep track of all the conspiracy theories that are going on in, on planet Earth. We're the ones that like to watch about the black helicopters and the contrails in the skies and the prison houses that are being built and the coffins that are being developed. And what I'm telling you from my experience, my testimony is, is that it is through the study of prophecy, through, because Jesus says, sanctify them through thy word, thy word is truth. And one of the purposes of prophecy is to present a message that is so interesting and so serious that the Lord draws you into a study of prophecy in order that he can accomplish the work of sanctification in you that is needed for you to stand among the 144,000. And the more you study prophecy, the more you will realize how little you understand about it, and the more you begin to realize, I wished I would have spent more time becoming familiar with the prophetic word that is set forth in the Bible in the spirit of prophecy. And therefore what I'm saying is, there needs to be a balance between the study of bi biblical prophecy and conspiracy information that is all out there. In fact, I almost say, just leave it alone. <laughs> Even if it's true, the truths that we need to understand about end time events are the truths that are identified in the Bible in the spirit of prophecy. They're not thoughts that bring you closer to Jesus Christ and does not give you that peace. If anything, it puts you in a state of alert that brings fear. And, and knowing God is, is, is not fear. There's another, another principle that goes with that. By beholding, you become changed. You could, it's safe to behold the message in the Bible and spirit of prophecy. But, but the conspiracy theories can, can change you. Well, yeah. Steals away time, and, and it makes you think, maybe, well, maybe I need to have some weapons. Yeah. Well, not only that, but... <laughs> <laughs> I know Adventists that have got to that point. Well, not only that, but the second angel's message is to come out of Babylon. Yeah. So, because Babylon means confusion. confusion. So, everything from... Feliz Sabado, Happy Sabbath, and I don't know how to say Happy Sabbath in Portuguese.